Welcome to CLCC Online. We pray that this message draws you towards Jesus and strengthens your walk with Him. We believe that we were meant to do life in community. So if you live in the Fraser Valley area, we would love to get you connected into the family. Find everything you need at clcc.ca. Enjoy. We are wrapping up our series called Plot Twists this weekend. In this series, we've been looking at different stories of Jesus where he put these incredible, I oh, man, I didn't see that happening moments in these stories. He did this so he could make his point stick. He could continue to push forward this new kingdom that he's trying to establish. Now we acknowledge, for those of us who grew up in church, the gospels can't really surprise us because we know the end of the story. So we've been trying to get in the, into the heads of those who are there, those who heard these stories the first day, and understand how much they changed the way that people thought in the first century about who God was and how he wanted people to live. Now, I grew up on the prairies. Every summer, there was not only a weather forecast, but we also had a mosquito forecast. They would let you know how many mosquitoes we would have that year. Now, sometimes there were few. But most of the time, it was terrible, like hide the young children terrible, because the mosquitoes were so large, they may carry your kids off. I remember a few times going to sleep as a teenager after being outside, not being able to fall asleep because I was so itchy, and I was wondering, why did God create mosquitoes? Now, I know some of you might be Googling that right now, so to keep you off of Google for a bit, let me tell you that they are a part of the ecosystem, and we do need them. But you don't think that when you're in a tent and you're finally falling asleep and a mosquito flies in your ear. When that happens, you ask the question, what is the purpose of this? I think that's a good question to ask about a lot of things. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 13. Feel free to turn there now if you have your Bibles or you can log on your YouVersion apps with your phones where you can even find our live event. You can even see our notes. So let's pick up on this string of stories that Jesus is telling in Luke chapter 13. We'll start at verse 6. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Now, I'm not much of a gardener, I, I, but I know that most of us who live in Abbotsford Mission in Aldergrove, we don't have to drive too far to see farmland. But there are actually people in this world who think that vegetables come from the grocery store. But let me tell you something about gardeners. If they plant peas or carrots, there better be some peas and carrots growing soon. <laughs> you don't want to waste space or seeds. Now, I can understand why this guy is disappointed. I, I, would, I would be too. You were expecting fruit, and all you got was leaves. Now, it's one thing for us not to have the proper vegetable pop up in a few weeks. We can always go to the grocery store and buy whatever we need. But in the first century, it would have been harder to get what you really wanted if it didn't grow. Let's keep reading verse 7. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years, and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The owner of this fig tree had enough. He says he's been waiting three years. Now I read it takes three to five years for a fig tree to start producing fruit. So the three-year thing checks out. Now, Jesus might know a little bit about growing figs. This tree should probably be producing something soon. And if it isn't producing fruit, it's taking up Space, space, something else should be producing. Something else could be there producing something. And he says, cut it down. Verse eight, the gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year. I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Now, I think this is where we see our plot twist. Isn't Jesus usually the really nice guy? You know, he heals the sick. He feeds the hungry. He, he's a person of second chances, of third chances. He tells his disciples to forgive those who hurt you 70 times seven. Jesus is telling people straight, and there's the warning there. Know what you're created for 
and fulfill your purpose. But here he's saying, if the fig tree is not producing figs, cut it down. Bottom line of this story, if the fig tree was not doing what it was created to do, do what you're created to do. The fig tree was not doing what it was created to do, so do what you're created to do. If you are a fruit tree, you just can't have leaves and look pretty. You have to produce something. Often, we ask the question, God, why am I here? What is my purpose in being here? Now, that's a huge question, and the specifics for each of us can be different. For a a fig tree, it's produce figs. But I don't think this story is about growing fruit in your backyard. It's about being someone who fulfills their purpose in life. What about you? What if you think of yourself as a Jesus follower? If, If you don't call yourself a Christian, your purpose might be something different, and I encourage you to find out what that is too. But your purpose... That's a huge topic. And there are probably some specifics that might be just for you. But maybe the million dollar question, if you think of yourself as a Christian or a Jesus follower, what do disciples do? Now, there's a bunch of things that Jesus asked his followers to do that we could talk about. Jesus told his followers to go into all the world and make other disciples. He told us to love our enemies and love our neighbors and the last two might be the same person. This theme of living your person shows up a few times in Jesus' teaching. In Matthew chapter 5, he actually gives his followers a nickname. He gives them a nickname to give them them an idea of what they were to do. And, And he tries to give them an image of what he wants them to be like. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus is summing up what their purpose is. And this is what he says. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus calls his followers salt. Now, when we think salt, we think salt is a taste enhancer. We put it on fries because fries without salt are just deep fried potatoes and nobody wants that. But put some salt on that and a little will go a long way. You turn them into French fries and we think enhancer. Now, they had a different view of salt in the context of their culture. In the, first century, in the first century, when they hear salt, they don't think fries. Salt was primarily used as a food preserver because that, back then, fridges were really expensive. I'm just joking. Refrigerators went around. Just want to make sure you were listening. Salt was the refrigerator of the world. People would take salt and put it in the meat so the meat wouldn't go bad. In essence, when he said that you are the salt of the earth, he was saying, you are the preserver of the entire planet. Your presence in the world is like salt in meat. Salt is to preserve, make a difference in in the food people ate. Jesus is saying, there is spoiling in the world around you, but you are to preserve God's culture because of who you are and your presence in the world. He's trying to get them to remember, salt always makes a difference. Jesus wanted them to keep this thought in their brains. He was giving them information on how God, had want, how God had want, wanted them to see the world. He wanted them to understand their purpose. Just like the fig tree's purpose was to produce figs, the Christian's purpose was to be salt in the world. And he knew that without them in the world, the world would rot faster and would spoil quicker. Jesus is telling them, If you're going to follow me, you will become the stewards of a brand new way of thinking. You are salt. You are the preservative of an entire planet. I know Jesus called us salt. Do you know that the one thing that Christians hate is rotting culture? We often run from it. Jesus calls us to run into it, rub up against it, make a difference. Salt makes a difference when you apply it to a substance. Sometimes Christians find something that they disagree with, and instead of getting more involved, they, they disengage. Let me tell you, salt doesn't make a difference if it's not applied. Jesus called you salt. Get involved in areas where you think there is rotting. What is your purpose? You are the salt of the earth. Make a difference. Jesus continues on with this teaching in Matthew 5.13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? 
There are some interesting things going on here. The phrase lots, lost its favor in the original language means a lack of wisdom. Jesus is saying that you are the wisdom of the world, but what will happen if the world loses you its wisdom? If the salt is no longer salty, if the wisdom of the world becomes foolish, if the right thing to do becomes the wrong thing, what if common sense becomes uncommon and becomes lost? He says, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? Or literally, by what can it be made salty? If this thought disappears, there is no hope because there will be no salt. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, in this part of the world, people didn't get salt from the sea. They got salt from salt marshes where the water came up to the land. They'd been saturated by salt water, plants, reed, bark, anything that had come in contact with the salt water. They would take those things and take them home and then rub them into the meat to preserve them. But over time, these things that they would rub on the meat would run out of salt and all that would be left is just a piece of bark. So the question gets asked, what do you do? What do you do with this leftover reed? What do you do with this leftover piece of bark? They would take whatever they had found had salt on them. And when they were used up, they would take it to the roof of their house and spread it out. And Jesus says, you know what it's like. What do you do? Once the stuff, once it has no more salt in it, you take it to your roof, scatter it over your roof, and people walk on it. It's no good for anything anymore. If the fig tree isn't producing figs, cut it down. If the reed that you got from the salt marshes stops giving you salt, throw it out. This is what he's saying to this group of people. You're the hope. You are the salt. You're the hope of the whole world. So don't live lives that are saltless. Because if you are saltless, you have no value. Now, God still loves you. But in terms of your effect on the world, you're not worth much. Do what you were created to do. If you're a fig tree, make figs. If you're salt, make a difference in your world. Most of us who are Christians today are Christians because we ran up against someone who was a little salty. They they may have been doing their own thing, but you ran into someone who saw the world a little differently. They didn't yell at you from across the street. You didn't read their sign they held high when they marched against whatever Christians might be protesting right now. They had a conversation with you over coffee. Now, you realize that they viewed morality different. They talk about God like they actually knew him. They said that they would pray for you, and they did. They lived a different kind of life. They viewed the world differently. They had a different set of glasses on. It it attracted you and it raised some questions within you and you began to ask those questions and you began to adopt some of their ideas and their view of the world and of God and of forgiveness and relationships. Humankind's purpose all along was to be in relationship with God. But something went wrong. And that's why we need the salt. Something went wrong with the fig tree. If you, if you leave meat without some preservatives, something will go wrong. Since the fall of mankind, there's been this natural inclination to sin. We all need something to help us with that. Maybe we need someone to help us with that. Maybe these salty people saved your marriage. Why did it happen? Because a preserving agent, someone you maybe lived, worked, studied, played with. They were preservative and they preserved you. Some of us can tell stories of being on the brink of making a really bad decision. And someone who was a little salty came along and said, if I were you, I don't know if I'd do that. And at first you didn't like it, but you paused. You might've thought they were just old fashioned. You thought, I don't like that. But their idea caused you to pause. Then you changed your mind and you think, she preserved my life. She preserved my relationship. She preserved my job. Some of you today are listening to this message and you're trying to figure out this this Jesus thing you're moving into and it's slow. The only reason you're in the process is because you ran into salty people. People that were living in a way that wasn't judgmental. And to be honest, you don't want to be a church person. 
you still have a lot of questions and you even ask some of those hard questions. The crazy thing is, is that people aren't really answering. These people aren't answering your questions. And when you ask the hard ones, they just say, I don't know. These people aren't even engaging you intellectually. But you think secretly, I'd love to have that kind of peace, that kind of faith. You would like to think that God will take care of me. They see the world different than you see it. And secretly, you hope that they're right. Secretly, you hope that you can get there someday. You know what that is? It's someone who's a little salty and you are, you are slowly being preserved. But they began to change the way you see the whole world. If you're a high schooler or college student, you are the salt of your school. You might say, "Uh, Troy, I don't have any influence on anything. No one's going to remember me once I leave here. But you are the preservative for your school. It doesn't matter if you have influence. You're salt anyways. If you live out the worldview, if if you live out how God has called you to live, you might hear that society, from society, that you can do anything with your bodies, with anyone. You're just flesh and bones. But you know that there's something else there. You know that you were created in the image of God and you can honor him with your bodies. You are the salt of your school. There might be someone here who turns down a promotion because you won't do a questionable deal. They tell you it's just business, but you say it's illegal. They say everyone does it, but you're salt. You have a different worldview. You aren't trying to change anyone else's mind. You're just saying, that's not how my morals work. Salt always makes a difference. Because you've, you've seen this happen. You've been on the receiving and maybe the giving end of this. People, people turn up their nose and walk away and wonder if you are really making a difference. Now, you might think, I, I don't see that I'm making a difference. And God says, you're always going to make a difference because salt always makes a difference. The fact that you are there living it out makes a difference. You might think, well, that's church business and my church business and my real business, my work business, they don't mix. But I bet you mix them all the time. If you thought you're going to lose your job, you would pray. You would instantly mix them. God, I know that these two don't mix, but right now I'm praying for my job that it doesn't get taken away. They all get mixed up. There's a tragedy that happened in your workspace. When something happened to a child, to one of your coworkers, you'd pray, you'd mix, you'd mix them up. Now you, you were made for a purpose. Start with being salt in your world. How much different would our lives be if we just asked the question, how can I be salt in the location where I live, work, study, and play in? How different would we be if we knew that we'd and we'd been placed in a school, job, neighborhood, sports team, family to be salt, to make a difference? You might think, I don't know if I'll make a difference, but salt always makes a difference. You might just be the only piece of salt in your whole family. There might not be another God-fearing person in your family, but you've been placed there for a reason. God wants us to come alongside a culture that needs preserving and to be, inf- uh, to be an influence by being there. Whether or not you, you know you're making a noticeable difference, you are making a difference with just you being there. Just like the fig tree exists to produce figs, you are the salt of the earth. Salt always makes a difference. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you have given us this story, this this thing of something very common that we almost see every day. Help us to remember, God, that that Jesus gave us this nickname of being salt to preserve the culture that you have entrusted to us. So Father, right now, I pray that we would be able to see different ways that we can be that preserving agent in the different areas in our lives. Help us to see that even this week. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Our doxology is from Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and 36. 
oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Hopefully we'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us. If you are looking to get connected, we are one church in multiple locations. Our Alder Grove campus meets at Parkside Elementary School Sundays at 1030. Our Abbotsford campus has three services each Sunday, 830, 10, and 1130. We would love to see you at one of our in-person gatherings. If you would like to financially support us, you can always give at cscca slash give. See you later.